Our guest today is Eric Karen. Eric is a retired U.S. diplomat, U.S. Special Agent, and HSBC Middle East Bank Executive. He's also the author of Switched On, The Heart and Mind of a Special Agent, and an adjunct professor at the Massachusetts Maritime Academy on Cape Cod, where he teaches a course on how to identify and prevent transnational crime and cybersecurity. Eric has held senior positions within the U.S. Department of Treasury, Department of Homeland Security, and Interpol. Throughout his career, he successfully initiated and managed covert operations that identified and disrupted international weapons of mass destruction proliferation networks, terrorism, terror financing, and transnational criminal networks involved in drug smuggling, human trafficking, and intellectual property rights violations. Man, do I feel like an underachiever compared to all that. He has currently been traveling and mentoring African officials over the past few years on how to disrupt and dismantle transnational and terror groups from destroying our environment, specifically the poaching of endangered wildlife and illegal logging. Eric is one of seven children and a fraternal twin. His late father was a decorated New Bedford, Massachusetts police officer and a Marine. He believes, as his father taught him, the family, country, and God come first. Amen to that, brother. He also strongly believes that, as John Adams once said, we are a nation of laws, not of men, and no man or institution is above the law. Eric Karen, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Hey, what an honor to be on with you, Chris. Um, I look forward to our conversation and and, and sharing um, my, my life story. It's going to be a great conversation, and I like to, to brag that this show is a show of firsts, and that introduction is got a lot of firsts in there, so we can check a lot of boxes on there. So, so thanks for all you've done for our, for our country. So thank you. Thank you, sir. And to that point, Eric, you've had such an extraordinary career, and in fact, several extraordinary careers, actually. Yeah. What are you passionate about these days? What gets you out of bed in the morning and gets you going now that you aren't doing things like disrupting weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, net, proliferation networks, can't even say it, drug smugglers, and international counterfeiting rings? You know, Chris, um, what gets me out of bed these these days really is the opportunity to travel this country, in fact, travel the world and share my switched on life story, my switched on life philosophy. Um, because if I did not live my switched on life philosophy, I would be I would be dead today. And um, that's no joke. Um, life is hard. And life comes out as fast and furious, as we all know. Your mother dies, your father dies, your your twin brother dies, your your wife decides she doesn't want to be married anymore. Um, your nephew dies in a car accident. Yes, that all happened to me, Chris. And um, so, I love sharing the principles of living a switched on life because even in darkness, if you're living the switched on life philosophies you can still see a path to greatness. So Eric, sticking with a show of first, let's go off script. Yeah. Let's talk about your switched on philosophy. Why don't you share that with everybody? Yeah. So, you know, first I learned this at a young age from my Marine Corps father. And my father, um, a, a shoe shine boy in the 1930s and 40s, uneducated, taught me everything I needed to know in life at a very young age, that the three core principles, I kept it simple for me to, to live a happy, successful life were strengthening the mind through education. It's a ticket to life's party. Without it, you're not getting in. So number one, the mind. Number two, the body. Sleep, eat, and exercise every single day. Sleep, eat, and exercise. The C philosophy. And then, of course, faith. Strengthening the, the soul through faith. Faith and fear, two opposing things, if you will. And it's all about living in faith. Um, that everything is going to be okay. And I like to say faith is like the wind. You can't see it, but you, but you feel it and you have to believe it. Um, and so I dive deeper into the mind, body, and soul. They're equally important. That's, that's what's important to understand that I think we've lost our way. We think taking a pill is, is, is the answer. It's not for the most part. So the mind, body, and soul, I see it as a Venn diagram, 
and I describe it and I show it as a Venn diagram. The mind, body, and soul, equally important, interrelated, and they have to be fed every day. Every day. So what did I do when I got up this morning? I got on that floor and I meditated and I did my stretches and I did my push-ups and sit-ups and I went for a walk or a run. I have to do it. That's my therapy. It keeps me alive and balanced. So many people are off balance, Chris, in this country. And they think taking a, a drug, a pill, either prescribed or not, is going to make things better. It's not. So strengthen the mind, body, and soul. And you're on your way to a happier life and you can overcome adversities. That's that simple. Eat, sleep, and exercise. Yeah. Why so, do we make it so complicated? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I hear you, brother. I mean, we got so many gurus on TV talking about taking pills and this contraption and do this and do that. We've lost our way in our, in our nation. I, I like to say, let's keep it simple. And the three most important things we do every day is strengthening the mind, body, and soul. You know, through sleeping properly, just sleeping heals the mind and the body. It makes the mind grow. I mean, exercising, Chris, studies have shown that through exercise, there's a molecule that's released in the mind, in the, bo in the body, in the mind that helps us survive and keeps disease away and strengthens our, our minds. It's actually like a happy molecule it's been described as, just by moving, just by exercising. So we don't need to take that extra drink or you know, smoke that weed to feel good. All we gotta do is, is simply move our bodies. And, and it's not doing a marathon. So there are simple things that I talk about when I lecture about how to live a switched on life. And, you know, it, it, I'm passionate uh, about, about talking and saving lives as, as you are, Chris. So is, you know, anybody looking for, uh, for a guest speaker, I'll do it for free for God's sakes and come to your church and come to your PTA meetings and talk about how to live a switched on life. You mentioned your dad earlier yeah. as a shine boy, you know, who was a police officer, Marine, Obviously, an inspiration to you. Yeah. Why did you choose to be a U.S. special agent instead of a city police officer? And what did it take to become a special agent? Wow, that's a that's a great question. You know, I think you're going to be surprised, maybe not, by my answer. It was through a tragedy that I became an agent, Chris. At the age of uh, 15, um, my dad died, and. Um, it still um, makes me emotional today that my hero suddenly passed uh, from a massive heart attack on the job. But that death put me on a path to where I am today of service to God and country and family. So through his tragic death, and I remember when the light bulb went on, when God or the universe or whoever you believe in spoke to me that this death of my father will be used in such a way that it will change lives around this world. And I'm proud to say that I have. We're going to touch on that in a bit in the show. Can you recall... Any uh, specific experiences or moments from your childhood or adolescence that sparked your interest in law enforcement? Or was it really your, your dad calling you? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think much like a, say, a priest and in many jobs, a doctor, it's, it's, a, it's a calling that is in, in you. Um, and yes, I was fortunate that I had a dad for 15 years who inspired me and, and made me think and, and made me appreciate God and family. And he was such a great role model for me. Um, and that's what's missing in America today. We're a fatherless society. We're a godless and fatherless society. 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 Is there any wonder why our country is in, in the pain that we see it in? 
um, most of our families don't have a father, especially in the inner city. Um, and so my dad was a great role model for me. And, um, and actually, I, I, I was going to be a chef. And, and, you know, I was an average, if you will, student. My twin brother was uh, an excellent athlete. So he went on to a traditional high school and I went to a trade school because my parents thought, you know what? I think you'll be successful as a cook, as a chef, Eric, because you like working in the kitchen. And I do. I still make a mean chocolate tart. But, you know, when my dad died, I went back to what I believe was my purpose in life. It, it instantly came to me that I was made to be a law enforcement officer, to, to help others, to serve others. And so halfway in my sophomore year, beginning of my sophomore year at a vocational school, I started preparing for college. And so, you know, again, the, the death of my dad, um, you know, jilted me, if you will, on a path to where I am today. Did you ever feel pressure to live up to certain expectations because of your father's career? And was it a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I, again, I, I use my dad as inspiration. You know, my dad set the bar high. Um, and, and, and his integrity, his honesty, um, his discipline, his love for his country, his family. So I never really felt um, that um, from my dad um, because he, he taught me so well. Um, you know, his philosophy was simple in life, really, as a, as at a young age. Just whatever you're doing, Eric, just just be happy and be the best at what you're doing. And he used to say, I don't care if you're a garbage man, Eric and Eddie, be, be the best garbage man that you can be. And so he, my dad was an inspiration and um, I speak to him every day. We talk a lot about resilience and personal well-being and next steps forward. And few people would need more resilience than some in your profession and the stresses it put you through. Mm -hmm. How would you define resilience, and especially in the context of your role as a special agent, and how did you develop and maintain your resilience? Well, again, great, great question. Um, again, life, life is hard. You know, life as an agent, you, you got your personal life, your, your, your family, as far as your wife or your husband, you got your children, you got your, your home, if you will, responsibilities. And then you got the office. And in the office, you have transnational criminal groups take, you know, wear, wearing on you every day. You're involved in covert operations, undercover operations that good guys' lives are at stake. And you are um, dealing with drug smugglers and human traffickers and child pornographers uh, and arms traffickers traveling the country, traveling the world. And again, um, it's easy to go to the dark side in life. And I don't, I don't fault or judge, I should say, good guys who go bad. Because I know the temptations are out there. You have those temptations in front of you every day. I was, I was involved in a drug case, driving down the road. Uh, actually, we did a search warrant. And at the house, there was money. A lot of money. And they said, well, the case agent looked at me as a young agent. Hey, Eric, uh, you want to drive the money back to the office? I said, sure. I'm driving down the road with about a half a million dollars in cash in about eight boxes behind me by myself. By myself. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, I, I could very easily reach back and take a handful of cash and stick it under my seat or in my pants. And no one would know. So you're surrounded by temptations. I didn't, by the way. You're surrounded by temptations every day as an agent. And um, so that's why I had to live the switched on life philosophy, 
mind, body, and soul every day and strengthening all of them equally important. So um, I could live a happy, healthy, straight, if you will, life as an agent because um, you turn, you can't turn it off at, you know, eight hours, 12 hours, you go home and um, your phone is ringing off the hook. Bad guys don't sleep. And then your wife is complaining about you haven't spent enough time with the kids. Um, you've been traveling too much and, um, you know, you, you've been distant. Well, I've been distant because I'm involved in a covert operation, undercover operation, and I'm trying to figure out how to get into this bad guy. So there's all that stress at home, all that stress and the frustration of prosecuting bad guys. And, um, and that's why, again, living the switched on life philosophy is, is in, was imperative and it's still imperative for me today. There are two kinds of resilience. There's physical and mental or emotional. Was either one of them more valuable than the other during your time as a special agent? You know, both. Again, um, the, the mind, body, and soul equally important. They have to be practiced and strengthened, fed every day. So they're equally important, Chris. You know, the mind, body, and soul, you, you, you got to strengthen them. You got to feed them because, you know, again, you're going to get that Monday morning call at 8 a.m. that your mother, your father, your brother just died. And uh, you better be ready for it because it's coming. You know, the yin and yang of life. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're here for. We understand that. Um, I, I, and in some respects, I was fortunate because at a young age, I had um, the experience of death um, in my life. And, and tragedies. So, um, you know, I understand how important it is to feed the mind, body, and soul every day so we can make good decisions. I can't make good decisions. Is it a shoot or no shoot situation? The bad guy wants to meet at this location. Should we meet him there or should we meet him at this location? Why is the bad guy asking to meet us at his location? Let's take a look, understand. Are we being set up? Is it a safe area? Is it a dangerous area? Um, how are we going to extract the undercover agent if he gets in trouble? I could not make these life and death decisions every day of my life if my mind, body, and soul wasn't being properly fed. What coping strategies do you employ to manage stress and maintain resilience over the long term? So I, again, I, I practice the mind, feeding the mind, body, and soul every day. Um, of course, getting that proper sleep, you know, getting proper nutrition, um, and praying a little bit, um, that everything's going to be okay. Um, and you know, I, I have to, I have to do that. I have to exercise every day as well. Um, I, you know, for what it's worth, Yoga is a great, great exercise for the body, but it's even better for the mind. And one of the best exercises that I've discovered in my research relating to um, the switched on life philosophy is swimming. Um, and because studies have shown that swimming, not only is it, of course, strengthening the body through, you know, the exercise and the strokes, but there's something going on in the mind that it's actually strengthening the mind because of the concentration that's happening relating to the breath and the, the body itself and the exercise. So swimming is one of the best uh, overall exercises for the mind and the body. So many times it can be difficult just working with the person sitting at the desk next to you. Teamwork is so important in law enforcement and successful investigations, but it has to be especially challenging working across jurisdictions and your national borders. Yeah. What were your cues to success when it comes to teamwork? Yeah, you know, first of all, you know, there's no I in team. And it's understanding, you know, I've led an office uh, of agents in uh, Boston and Providence, Rhode Island, uh, overseas in Dubai, I led the office in, in, in the United Arab Emirates. Um, a group of agents, as well as 
other uh, officials, um, analysts, um, task force officers from the local police or state police. So you have a, you know, a hodgepodge of people and personalities, um, mostly men, some women, but mostly men with big egos um, and type A personalities. So as a manager, um, you, you have to understand each and every asset, each and every person. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? How am I going to help them overcome their weaknesses? Um, and, and, and so understanding collectively as a group, making sure they all understand what the plan of action is, making sure they all understand the importance of each of them to, to the case, I'll say to the puzzle, that they all, they're all piece of the piece, they're, they all serve as a piece of this puzzle, equally important. You know, I, I, I've been involved in situations where um, I had a minor role to play, but if, if I didn't execute, then that would affect everybody else above me, if you will, or the case. So everyone's role is important in understanding that uh, it takes a team to um, be to be successful in life. It really does. How do you remain adaptable and flexible in dynamic and unpredictable situations? And can you provide examples of how you've successfully adapted to changing circumstances? Well, I think training, of course, education, training is, is important. Um, that, that muscle memory that you build when you, when you, when you go, when you're educated, when you train, um, understanding the plan and understanding the, the backup plan, if you will, if X happens, then I'll do Y. Um, that's, that's very important. So planning education is critical, um, and, and no matter what we do in life, um, and it was very important um, as, as an agent to plan properly, educate, practice. Visualization is important. Um, vi visualizing what we're doing and how we're doing it. And if something was to happen, how do we, how do we recover? So, um, yeah, vis visualization is important. And what measures do you take to prioritize your physical and mental well-being amidst the, the demands of your job? Well, it's, it's, um, for me, for me, Chris, it beats sitting in a therapy chair that I, I make me, Eric, um, the number one priority each day because not in a selfish way, but if I'm off balance in my mind, body, and soul is not being fed, I can't, I can't help anyone. I can't help Chris. I can't help my, my, my sons. I can't help anybody if I don't prioritize me first in a healthy, balanced way. So I'm strengthening my mind, body, and soul every day. Again, it's not necessarily for, uh, look at my muscles, look at me. It's for in here. It's for in here. Because, you know, as you think, Chris, so shall you become. I think Bruce Lee said that. So, you know, how many people do you know and I know are on some form of medication? Because they're not making themselves a priority. For whatever reason, they're making others or other things a priority. Make yourself a priority. Get your life in order. Start strengthening the mind, body, and soul then you can help others. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, where can people learn more about you and the Switched On Life? Well, yeah, you know, uh, thank you, Chris. It's uh, Switched On Life is my website. Switched On Life is my website. And um, the book and the audio book is on Amazon. It's on my website as well. But um, the audio book is on Amazon. It's outstanding. Um, I tried, I tried doing the, uh, the voice, but it would have taken me like five years to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, 
it's so I hired a voice actor and I know I know my story is impactful and life changing because the director came back to me weeks later after he was done. He goes, Eric, I want you to know. Um, Joe uh, wanted me to tell you that this is the first time in doing this as a career as a voice actor that he cried about six times and I'm thinking yes yes because that's what you want you want the reader to be to, to be moved to action right and so um, the audio book is, is inspirational. Um, I got a little music sprinkled in and, uh, and, uh, yeah. So Amazon is a great place to find it or wherever you find your fine books. So Eric, again, we're gonna go a little bit off script. We we're talking during the break. Yeah. Explain what money laundering is and how it typically occurs and how or why does it affect the person listening to our conversation right now? Well, Chris, you know, let me ask you, why do people commit crime? Because they think they get away with it. For money. Most crimes are committed for money, unless it's a, usually a crime of passion, like homicide, murder. But most crimes are made, are, are, are conducted, if you will, for, um, for money. And so let's, for instance, say uh, I'm a drug smuggler. I just got paid a million dollars. A million dollars, cash. I got to do something with that money. So bad guys want to do, what they want to do is hide the source of, of that money, right? So they have to clean it, make it look legit. Make that drug money that I just got, a million dollars in cash, for instance, I have to make it look like it's got gotten from a, a legal job of some sort. So I have to wash it. I have to clean it to make it appear to be legit. And so there's many, there's a few different methods in, 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 in that, in doing so. One, um, the first is placement, if you will. Placing dirty money into banks or front companies. Um, and, 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 and so I have to, for instance, I go to the bank, uh, and deposit the, the dirty money, the million dollars in different bank accounts. And I split it up and, and then I have to layer it. So maybe I start moving it to various bank accounts, um, to make it look like a legitimate purchase. Maybe I make, I have a buddy in Colombia or in Mexico or in the Netherlands. Um, and maybe he has a front company. Um, and so I make it look like maybe this it's payments. Maybe I dummy up invoices. So layering. So we have placement, layering, and then of course, integration, the three steps, if you will, of money laundering, placement, layering, integration. And integration is simply buying things. Now, it could be the house, could be the boat, um, or any other products. Or maybe I commingle. Maybe I have a company, and maybe um, I buy more washing machines to sell with dirty money. Um, so that's basically it. As far as money laundering concern is concerned, it's not that difficult. It can be difficult to detect, um, um, but we've now have in place good partnerships with our financial institutions throughout the world. Um, good software, um, good investigators um, who who understand money laundering, uh, understand the red flags of money laundering. So we can dismantle um, these transnational crime groups and terror groups. So you talk about the financial institutions, how do they contribute to or combat money laundering? And you talked about software, you know, how's the technology helping the government get better at stopping it? Yeah, um, and good question. I mean, we rely 
heavily on banks to partner with the with the good guys, if you will. Um, and there are certain uh, legal um, protocols in place that require banks to file different reports to regulators um, and the federal government because, you know, there's bank officials, there's state officials, there's federal officials. Um, it can be a daunting task to keep up with all the regulations, but they're there to make sure they're not touching dirty money and that their customers aren't dirty. Um, and so the, the banks are required to fill out what they call suspicious activity reports, SARS, suspicious activity reports. And that's been talked about in the last year or so relating to the current administration um, and the fact that banks filed SARS on Hunter Biden and Joe Biden and others because they're required to, uh, because if they don't, they potentially face penalties. Um, so banks are actively uh, working to stop illegal, uh, to stop money laundering because, um, you know, it, it affects our nation. It, affect, it affects our, um, you know, corruption uh, increases if you allow money laundering. Um, so it's important that banks um, partner with federal authorities and state authorities to to stop money laundering. So I live about 35, 40 miles outside New York City. And I always scratch my head when I walk through Times Square and you see dozens of these souvenir stores. Yeah. Now, I know there are a lot of tourists coming to New York. I know they all go to Times Square. I always scratch my head and think, can they really stay afloat? Like, I know how much rent costs in Times Square. Is this a front for something else? I'm just curious your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, so to charge, understand, Chris, uh, for the federal government, and the federal government is the only entity, federal agencies, be it the FBI, Homeland Security Investigations, IRS. Um, there's a, only a handful of federal agencies that can charge money laundering. So you'll never see a state agency charge money laundering because it's not a state charge. And so to charge money laundering, you need a specified unlawful act first that serves as, as the foundation. So you don't see money laundering, a standalone charge of, I'm gonna charge Eric with money laundering alone. So the specified unlawful act for Eric, cause I'm an international drug smuggler, I'm a smuggling drugs, the proceeds of drug smuggle, uh, the, the proceeds stem from an unlawful act, specified unlawful act, which is drug smuggling. It could be human trafficking. It could be arms trafficking. There's over a dozen different crimes that um, that serve as the specified unlawful act to charge money laundering. And one of them is is counterfeiting. Um, so IPR violations that you know you see all the counterfeits in New York Times Square. So if the authorities can build a case, show that the goods are, are indeed counterfeit and that the, the individual has knowledge and intent to distribute counterfeits, be it Gucci or Chanel or um, whatever, counterfeit Viagra pills. That's the specified unlawful act. And then you can charge money laundering if you can show and tie the money to the specified unlaw unlawful act. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of those shops in Times Square are certainly probably engaged in some form of illegal activity. Like you said, um, anybody with eyes to see and ears to, to hear understand that the rent alone is probably $10,000, give or take, a month in Times Square. And, you know, they're selling bags. So 
Yeah, I mean, that's why it's important that our federal authorities and state authorities um, don't allow crime to to grow because it's like cancer. As we see it, as we, as we have seen it over the last few years, Chris, crime has, has grown uh, in our inner cities. And it's because police officers at the local, state and federal level have, quite frankly, been neutered. And it's sad um, because, you know what, Chris, they stand in the gap between good and evil every day. And there's a lot of evil out there. I've seen it. Many people in this country sit back and they have these lovely homes in these bedroom communities and they don't they don't get a chance to go to Chicago, nor do they want to go to Chicago or care to go to Chicago, New York or Newark or Philly. And so but the good guys of law enforcement go and they have to uh, take down, if you will, in a legal way, of course, the bad guys, because the bad guys will commit continue to commit crime of rape and destruction and murder and theft if you allow them. And we, we as a nation, these last three, four years, we have allowed criminals to, to hurt and maim good Americans, and that should not happen. The next topic is one that, unfortunately, we have to talk about and to address most recently, we had, I believe, it was our 24th mass shooting of the year. Today is March 19th. That's one about every three-ish days, three or four days. Yeah. So I think one of the questions that a lot of Americans find themselves asking is how to best protect themselves and their families from violence and specifically active shooters. Yeah. Great question, Chris. Great. Thank you. You know, first, we, you know, I wrote an article. It's up on my website, Switched on Life. How... How America failed its students. Our, our students have to go to school every day wondering whether or not they're going to make it home. Are you kidding me? I mean, be, between knives and guns, m- most students in America are afraid to go to school. We have failed our students our kids in America. Why? Because again, we've become a fatherless society, a godless society. We're not teaching basic life, if you will, principles um, that are so important, service to others. Um, And it goes on and on. I mean, so it's important now than ever that we get switched on. First, the mind, body, and soul that's important. That's the foundation. I, 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 you know, all, relating to these active shooters and traumatic incidences, I wrote an article about five to survive. Five simple tips to survive active shooters and threats as, as such. But first, we have to get switched on, the mind, body, and soul. Because if we're not living the switched on product, philosophy we can't think appropriately if you will so that's that has to be the core principle first foundation the switched on and then how to how to identify bad guys and i talk about well, number one engaging all senses and trust your instincts so you want to be able to see like clark kent you want to be able to hear and smell like a canine When you're out on the street. So engage our senses. And trust instincts. Number two. Scan the environment. And plan. Simple. So I'm not saying. I want to make sure this is clear to you Chris too. And you're in the the viewers. I'm not. I don't want anybody to be hyper vigilant. and, and, And be. I want this to be. Like brushing your teeth every day. I want this to be natural, that this becomes part of your everyday well-being, is, is understanding, living the switched on life philosophy, and then understanding the five, five to survive points. Again, one, engage all your senses and your instincts. Scan the environment and plan. 
identify a primary and a secondary entrance exit to wherever you're going. Safe havens in those establishments. Where am I going when poop hits the fan? How am I getting out of this building? Or where do we go? Where do I go when a terrorist enters the hotel? I know. I've been there. I go to the basement because that's where the safe room is. It's a safe. And when I left Afghanistan one year, um, just as I left, the Taliban hit the place I was at and um, killed a bunch of people. And um, I knew exactly where that safe haven was in the basement of that hotel, in the kitchen, and how many stairs it took for me to get downstairs. So... Cover And then understanding the difference between cover and concealment, understanding that not everything that you hide behind is going to stop a bullet. So if, you know, I'm behind a refrigerator, that's a good thing. But if I'm behind a piece of, I don't know, wooden uh, table, if you will, or underneath, that may not stop a bullet from, from penetrating and hitting me. Um, you Again, so engage all instincts. Scan the environment, scan for people. How many instances, Chris, do you hear, do I hear, every, pretty much every week? Yeah, that person looked kind of off. He, you know, he, yeah, he had a backpack and, or he was talking to himself. He was standing in the corner and, you know, for about an, an hour talking to himself. A little off. If you see something, say something. NYPD's fa- fa- famous, famous motto. So scan for people that maybe don't belong. Um, or maybe wearing clothes that, geez, that's, it's, why has he got a, a heavy jacket on or a big backpack like it's full of explosives on the church steps in New York City? So, Scan for people that don't belong or out of the ordinary. Breathe, number four. Breathe, actually, breathe. Hear and focus on the breath. So as an agent in training and in, in search warrants and arrest, if you will, going in hot into a, a crack house, if you will, drug house at 6 a.m., um, knowing there's bad guys behind that door and guns as well, Colombians. If I went in, if I hit the door with the, the, usually about eight to 10 of us, if I hit the door and holding my breath, do you think I can think straight? No. So that breath that I talk about is like the fighter pilots fighting G's. So when you're in a stressful situation, whatever it is, especially during an after shooting shooter situation, breathe. Breathe in such a way that you hear your breath. It's like, (sighs) 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 because that breaks tunnel vision number one, because you're going to be, do I fight or flight? You don't want to, you don't want to freeze. You want to go to that plan that you have back here. You want to bring that plan forward to the P brain here. So if I'm holding my breath, it's going to be difficult for me to think. Relating to what am I going, where am I, where am I going, what am I doing, what's the plan of action that I have back here. So breathing helps us, helps us escape, helps us get to that plan of action in the back of the, of the mind. And then number five, just like number one, it should be number one as well engaging senses and trust your instincts. I want to, my mantra, your mantra, from today on, Chris, wherever you go, I want you to identify threats in your physical as well as your emotional world. I want you to avoid those threats. I want you to escape those threats. Because once the bullets start flying, there's no telling, or, or fists, no telling how it ends. 
So what I preach, Chris, is identify threats, avoid and escape, both on the street and in, in your personal life, in your marriages, in with your kids. So five to survive. It's up on my website, switchedonlife.com. But I, I think it's imperative that um, we, we understand. Train the mind. The body will follow. Train the mind. The body will follow, Chris. If you don't, potentially you die. That is so important that for you and your audience to understand, you have to train the mind or the body will die because because we're looking for a plan of action. If it's not there, we're going to freeze. And that's when people get hurt. A few minutes ago, you mentioned crime being on the rise. You just talked about the Taliban. Yeah. As, you, as you look at our southern border, how do you assess the threats of terrorists entering the U.S. from Mexico? Hi. Extremely high. Now, I, I want, you know, we, there are so many threats going on right now, Chris, across this globe. And unfortunately, Americans think, well, that happened, that's happening 8,000 miles away. That's not going to affect us. Yeah. What happened on 9 11? Osama bin Laden was hatched out of Sudan and Africa. And we didn't take him out when we had the opportunity. He went on to Afghanistan where he planned 9-11. And that, Chris, unfortunately, is happening again today. It's not just the Mexican cartels because they're, they're, they're a terror organization. They should be sanctioned as, as a terrorist organization. Don't ask me why they're not. But there's a, a top four, five uh, uh, cartels in Mexico. That we know who they are. And they're, you know, responsible for what? I think since 2000, this number should stagger everybody. A million people in America have died from overdose. How about that? I I know because I researched it. A million people died in America. That's the size I think of. I think it's Phoenix, Tampa. I don't know about that. Gone. A million people from drug overdose, mostly from Mexico, are coming across the Mexican border. Maybe it starts off in Colombia or Bolivia or Peru, comes through Mexico. Um, But Mexico, the cartels are manufacturing their own own cocaine now. A million people have died. When are we going to wake up? On average, 50,000 Americans die from suicide every day year. 50,000 Americans that we know of die from suicide every year. We can do better. We have to do better. And so I'm very concerned that right now our southern border is wide open. Chris, understand there's 328 official ports of entry into America. Land, air, sea, we, think we, don't, we, we don't talk about the shipping containers that come on into America on, on vessels or on real um, that, that aren't being looked at. Less than 2% are being physically opened. Um, we have the Taliban controlled of Afghanistan. A terror organization is, is in control in Afghanistan. I've seen the reports. I follow... Um, I have sources in, in in all over the all over the world. It's been some of this has been reported, Chris. But what's happening in Afghanistan should frighten every single American right now. The Taliban has implemented dozens of schools for terrorist training. They have a suicide brigade in Afghanistan military. The Taliban has a suicide brigade. They're issuing passports. How are they issuing passports? What's the vetting process happening in, in, in Afghanistan right now? Who's vetting these people? We know people responsible for the Benghazi assault that killed our ambassador are in 
Afghanistan today. Um, the world is very, very dangerous right now um, with dozens of terror groups around uh, in, in, in Middle East, in the Middle East, as well as Africa. No one's talking about Africa. I just came back from Africa. It's been like my ninth or 10th trip to, to, to Africa in the last year and a half. And I can tell you ISIS is active throughout Africa. Um, they, we have 22 shadow wars, secret wars going on. We, the U.S. government, fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda and other terror organizations, including Boko Haram in Africa. The situation in Africa right now, as we know in Sudan and South Sudan and Chad, Niger, is very, very dangerous. And if we don't think that what's happening in Africa won't affect us, again, Chris, just go back to 9-11. Eric, thanks so much for being with us today. We're out of time. I'm Chris Meek. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.